Good morning and welcome to Crown Life Lutheran Church. We're glad you've joined us today for worship. If this is your first time worshiping with us, uh, welcome. Um, we'd love for you to uh, check out our website where you'll be able to find our worship folder and follow along. We'd love for you to participate as we worship together. The address is crownoflifenola.com slash worship. Also, you'll be able to find on there a connection card um, that allows us to know who's been worshiping with us and it gives you opportunity for prayer requests and comments and suggestions if you have them. Um, we love to, to figure out how to serve you and improve our online worship. So um, if you do have a Bible at home, I encourage you to grab it. That's a, a good way to follow along. Some of the scripture refer references that I will be reading today aren't found printed in your bulletin. So grab your Bible. Um, with that, let's go ahead and begin with worship. Uh, we begin worship following uh, the bulletin, the order of service, and we begin on page two. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When we gather before a holy God, we will see our sinfulness. That's why we confess our sins and ask his forgiveness. We confess together. Merciful Father, I confess that I am a sinner. I make no excuses. I have sinned against you by the things I have done and the things I have not done. But I know that Jesus died for me. I stand before you in need of and trusting in your forgiveness. Amen. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his Son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's join together in prayer. Almighty God, we confess that we deserve to be punished for our evil deeds, but we ask you graciously to cleanse us from all sin and to comfort us with your salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So our lesson for today is from John chapter 11, and some of you probably know the story pretty well, of Jesus and Lazarus, and Lazarus got sick and he died, and, and Jesus goes to see him. If you know it, I want you to forget the last half of this lesson, the last part of it. That's vitally important for a lesson, but I don't want you to be biased going into this, and I want you really to see from the, the standpoint of Mary and Martha and the bystanders that were there, I want you to see Jesus from that viewpoint. Because you're going to notice something here that is maybe very similar to what we're going through now. That sometimes there are things that really change. Like people right now are talking about how this is going to change this crisis is going to change our business and change economy and people are even writing articles how this will change the church and how we interact with each other. Uh, are we going to be more standoffish? How are we going to greet each other? How are we going to give? How are we going to go do ministry work? That It's all going to change. Some things might go back, but it seems like there's a lot of things that will never go back. One thing that has changed drastically is how we're nice to each other. What you did two and a half, three weeks ago is not the same thing that you could do today, where if, if you were, uh, you love someone, um, if you want to say hi to someone, you would shake their hands, you would give them a hug, you'd give them a kiss on the cheek, and if you did that today, that, that's almost, it seems like it's almost illegal. I don't know if you heard of what Florida is doing now, but anyone from Louisiana traveling to Florida has to self-quarantine under the threat that you get 60 days in prison if you don't. So things definitely are changing and how we're acting toward each other are changing. Where maybe we were more relational before, nice relationally, and that, that includes touching and hugging and kissing, now we're more concerned about being nice for our well-being. Quarantine, uh, staying six feet, social distancing, it's, it's all changed uh, how we're nice to each other. 
And as we go through our lesson, I want you to, from Mary and Martha's and the bystanders' perspectives, see Jesus and ask, is he, is he nice? Because I don't know if he is. Let's, the setting here is chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. It makes sense. If you love someone, you want someone to tell you what's going on, especially if they're sick. You want to know when you need to be there for that person, and, and that's what Mary and Martha seem to be doing for Jesus. They're giving Jesus a heads up. Lazarus isn't doing so well. Maybe you should come and see him. That, that might be an invitation for him. And it's kind of what we do as people. It, it shows that we really value the person more than we value our work or the distance that we have to travel for it or everyday regular life and tasks. We go and we go and comfort them and be with them. We value them more than everything else. And Mary and Martha knew that about Jesus. They said he loved Lazarus, and so maybe they anticipated Jesus coming to see Lazarus. And knowing who Jesus was. Like Mary and Martha, they, they knew what Jesus did and the miracles that he performed and the healings and bringing people back to life. He did all that, and it would be a good thing to have Jesus there, Right? But when he heard this, he said to his disciples, yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he said, he stayed where he was for two more days. Verse 7, when he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Okay, maybe Jesus was busy or couldn't make it. But it really kind of seems that Jesus is coming off as cold. Not going to see someone he loved who is sick and who he knew very well, as you see in the next few verses, who was deathly sick. As he's traveling around with his disciples, all of a sudden he, he just stops and says, he's dead, he's fallen asleep. And... It's as if he knew this was coming, and yet he didn't react to it. He didn't go to Mary and Martha. And, and this gets into our verses for today. Verse 17, this is more surprising. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in a tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem. So it's not as if Jesus was busy. It's not as if he was too far away. He was only two miles away. He could have simply walked over there within a matter of, of minutes almost to go see Lazarus, and he doesn't. It's, it's almost as if he tries to avoid that situation for some reason. And he comes off kind of like a jerk. It doesn't seem like he's being very nice at the moment. Even though Mary and Martha know who he is and what he can do. You have other Jewish people come and it says in verse 19, many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. They came and maybe right away to comfort them and, and share their condolences with Mary and Martha, but it took Jesus a few days and four days in the tomb. That's when Jesus showed up. It seems like all this was just kind of on Jesus' back burner. It wasn't important to him. Because it would have been nice if Jesus showed up. And it would have been nice if Jesus healed. And it would have been nice for him to show his compassion and his concern for Lazarus, but he, he does it in a way that's 
just doesn't seem nice. And we begin to see Jesus pulling something different out here. See, maybe it's because niceness isn't always good. We sometimes think it is. If you're, you're nice, you're doing something good for someone. But, but think of the times where niceness is not good. Maybe you're nice when you see something in someone's teeth and you don't say something about it because you want to be nice and not embarrass them in front of their friends or in front of you. Is that really nice? Think of how we like to be nice and save face for people. Someone says something wrong and maybe we save face and let it slide. But then we never address it. We, our niceness, is that really good? Or when we see someone sinning or getting um, kind of sucked in by sin, is it easier for us to be nice and look away and say, it's, it's not my issue. I don't want to embarrass them and their sin. Is that really good? Because it, it could come off, and it is. It's really unloving. So Jesus, he doesn't come. He doesn't uh, sit by Lazarus' side when he is sick. He doesn't heal Lazarus. And because of that, that causes a lot of sorrow and pain. So Jesus comes from Jerusalem to Bethany, and it says, uh, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Martha knew. Martha knew Jesus, what he could do. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. You can't underestimate Martha's statement here. You see, when it comes to um, a statement of faith, this is maybe one of the more clear statements of any of Jesus' disciples about Jesus' resurrection and what it accomplishes. This accomplishes resurrection for Lazarus on the last day. Mary believed that. She knew it. And the... That's what gave her hope now. Her brother was gone. She knew it. And so, so now it was past hoping that he would live again, and she was looking forward to the final day when Jesus would return. And, and Jesus he says to her, your brother will rise again. I don't, I don't know how to take this. I think Mary took it really well, or Martha took it really well. But Jesus, you're right there. You could have been right here. You missed the opportunity to avoid sorrow and suffering, and yet you somehow took a weird journey around for a few days so that you show up on the fourth day that he's in the tomb. Just doesn't seem nice. That's because Jesus here is, he's pulling at something else, right? He's not so concerned about being nice. Being nice last week changes from one week to another. He's, he's not so worried about the ceremony of being nice and showing up and, and sharing condolences. If you have a, a study Bible, you can see in, in verse 19 where it says, it talks about the mourning. For three days, they have heavy mourning. They, in their sorrow, they, they weep. And then for four days after that, they have more heavy mourning. And then for 30 days after that, they have a lighter mourning. And people and family come during that time to, to share their comfort and encouragement with the family. And Jesus could have easily avoided all that. Mary and Martha, they mourned. They suffered from losing their brother. Even Jesus, when he went to the tomb, 
he was deeply moved, it says, and you have the, the shortest verses in the Bible. He wept. And you begin to see Jesus is after, maybe not being nice. Because being nice in this world, I mean, the, the world was never nice to him. It put him up on the cross. It, it beat him. It, it rejected him. He's after goodness. He's after what's ultimately good for Lazarus and Mary and Martha. And you could tell that by verse 17, where it says, On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in a tomb for four days. And then, verse 38 and following, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, Martha said, the sister of the dead man, by this time it is bad there is a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So he took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you would always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Then the dead man came out and his hands and feet wrapped with cloths of linen, strips of linen and the cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Okay, this is a mini Easter. You got a lot of the same elements because it's this kind of the same setting. Uh, someone in a tomb, someone who's been buried. You got the, the stone that was rolled away. You had the burial cloths that were on his hands and his, his feet. It was a mini Easter, but the thing that was different about this mini Easter was the day. This was the fourth day. This was not the third day. Jesus died and rose in three days, and here Lazarus is on the fourth day he is rising. And if you, if you have a study Bible, you can see the significance of this. Verse 17, the note says, Many Jews believe that the soul remained near the body for three days after death in the hope of returning to it. If this idea was in the minds of these people, they obviously thought all hope was gone. Lazarus was irrevocably dead. So this superstition that the soul hung around the body for three days, maybe that's why they mourned so heavily for the first three days. And then on the fourth day, that was the day when hope ended. When all hope was gone for this person to rise again and that's significant because Jesus showed up on that day the day beyond hope the day beyond resurrection in their minds and what Jesus did was something that was so good and so so different from what they expected he came and he rose he raised Lazarus from the dead on the fourth day. The day after all hope was gone. Like the day when nothing should come back from that day. It's a, it's a day that's, that we face sometimes in our lives, figuratively speaking, the fourth day we face when it seems like Jesus missed the opportunity to care for us and watch over and be there for us and show us how valuable we are when it comes to our health and our finances and our jobs. We wonder where Christ is and he sometimes comes off like looking like a jerk where he doesn't seem nice, where he could have offered us comfort and convenience that we wanted, but then he pushes us to that fourth day where it seems like it's all gone. And yet he gives it again. He pushed Mary and Martha through sorrow and suffering to get them to that fourth day to show them that they may believe that it, even when it passes the third day, even when it passes the point where there, there is no more hope when it comes to Christ and his salvation and resurrection, there is still hope there. 
That's why he says, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. If you jump back to verse 14, so he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe. He was about doing what was good for his people, that, that he created great faith in them, proving he could do the insurmountable, overcome the, the, the least probable case that there is. He did it in Lazarus, and that's, that's why you see him waiting around. He didn't want to do what was nice. He didn't want to just patch Lazarus' life up and keep it going. He wanted to prove his resurrection, and that's why you have this mini Easter on day four. Jesus only took three days. He went in the grave. He, he died for our sins, taking punishment of death and defeating the devil. And he wants us to know that that resurrection doesn't end on day four. When Jesus doesn't seem like he's around, when God doesn't seem like he's here, when sorrow and suffering happen, he still comes to us and he says, my resurrection still counts for you. I am not being kind and nice. I'm not listening to, to what people say. I'm listening to what my heavenly father says to give you what is good. And here you have what's good. That when all hope runs dry, when sickness catches up to you, when your finances are a mess, when your job is insecure, in that fourth day, you still have hope. You still have permission to hope in the life that God has given you. And he's working strong faith in you through it. Because unlike Martha, we can look back to the resurrection. And we could see the grave that is empty and the linen cloths that are placed there and the stone that has been rolled away. And we, we know it happened. And we believe the implications for our lives. That, that even in suffering and pain and crisis, even when it seems like there is no hope at all, Jesus is there with us on that fourth day, giving us what's good. Might not be convenient for us, might not be the comfort that we want, but it's the good we need. You think of this with the, the Jewish nation and the Romans, certainly it would have been nice for Jesus to pin down the Roman government and give them their religious freedom to worship however they wanted. He didn't. He allows them to suffer through it. But the results of that is a church that isn't just there. It's a church that's everywhere. It's a worldwide church that has spread to every corner of the world. You, you have a a savior who, who comes to, to Lazarus and he shows you that even in, in death, even when no hope is there, you, you are still being worked into God's plan of salvation for eternal life. When your, your suffering and your pain come along, that, that's all valuable for you because you look back and you see the resurrection and someone who suffered in your place, so you don't have to suffer any anymore. Jesus isn't about being nice. He's about being good. And he was good for us. He was the good that we needed for salvation. And every suffering and every sorrow now becomes a work of glory in us. 
how do we how do we deal with a situation like we're in right now? Coronavirus. How do we deal with our everyday suffering? Perhaps it's God throwing a, a wrench in it all and showing us that the systems and the, the ways in which we thought society would operate if we didn't have them, it would all fall apart, but it's still operating now by the grace of God. But then we, we see he, he's doing more than that and he's giving us his goodness. That on the fourth day in our life, on the fifth day, in the sixth day, his resurrection still counts for us. Let's join together in prayer. Uh, there's a few special prayer requests for today. Uh, first, for a few of our members who have tested positive for coronavirus, for um, Wanda's daughter, Bridget, and her daughter, Wanda's granddaughter. Um, they are recovering. Um, Lord willing, we'll be back to full health soon. Celeste also is recovering from uh, her positive test of coronavirus, and then Catherine's, Catherine's sister-in-law and her sister-in-law's husband are currently at the hospital going through treatment for the virus. So we pray God's blessings for them and that he give them quick recovery. Um, we'll, we also pray for all those who are working to help uh, deal with this crisis, our, our, our police officers, our first responders, our doctors, our nurses, and then our, our government, we pray God that bless them and lead them to help us through this crisis. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Almighty God, the consolation of the sorrowful and the strength of the weak, hear the prayers of those who cry out to you in sickness or sorrow, in trouble or distress. Grant relief to those suffering pain, comfort to those who mourn, and recovery to those burdened by illness and disease. Look with compassion on the homeless and destitute, those whose inner hurts we cannot see, and all who have none to care for them. Soothe and heal all who are broken in body and spirit, and bring us all to the perfect peace and rest in heaven. We pray, dear Lord, uh, especially for uh, Bridget and her daughter, for Celeste and for Catherine's sister-in-law and her husband. Watch over them and bring them healing and comfort if it is your will. Send your angels to guide the doctors to watch and care for them and do what is necessary to bring them a healing and health. We also pray for our city and our workers and our first responders, our doctors and our nurses. Watch over them, um, give them encouragement. It's a difficult time for them as they try to maintain uh, order and try to deal and help the sick and the ill. Uh, lead our leaders um, that they may serve us and serve um, the, our community for the, the good and for recovery. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We join together now in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you again for tuning in and worshiping with us today. Um, if you, again, if you are a first-time visitor or watching with us today, please sign the Connect card on our worship web webpage. Um, throughout the week, we'll be sending information and uh, updates as far as the coronavirus and our congregation. If you have not been receiving that, please let me know, um, follow up with me, and I'll make sure you get on our, our mailing and text list. Um, we're also going to be working to give the kids, the Sunday school kids, some material so parents can take them through the week and uh, Trent has uh, kindly agreed to make a video for them so that they get some sort of normalcy in their Sunday school teaching. So if you need anything, um, let me know if you need any help or know of anyone who is in need of help, um, please reach out to us. I pray we can be a blessing to you. Um, God's peace to you uh, today and every day of your lives.